Well, next on the program was going to be our video for Generosity Campaign Week 2 for On Compassion, but since our screens aren't working, you're going to have to log on and watch it on the Facebook page later this week, or I don't know, maybe they'll double up and show you extra TV next Sunday. They'll have to decide. Um, but uh, we're going to launch right on into our message for this morning. Uh, here we are in Generosity Campaign Week 2. Started off well last week. I wasn't here. How'd it go? All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, generosity campaign is this time of our year. It, it, it's perfect for it to be in the fall because as we're approaching the end of the year, we want to kind of look back and celebrate the ministry we've done together and to thank God for what God has done among us and what we have done for each other and for the community and to, to kind of evaluate how did we do? Were we faithful to the calling that God had? And churches, if you haven't noticed, are weird. One of the things that's really weird about us is that churches, unlike a lot of other organizations or businesses or things like that, we run entirely on voluntary giving. Everything we have was given at a point, and everything we have to give is what we kind of all have left over from what the world leaves us, right? All of our staff, you know, and the, and the way that we pay them, all of our resources, the things and the gear and the buildings we have, even the energy that we have to do the work of ministry, it's, it's all voluntary. And so everything we have only exists because someone at a certain point gave it. All of us even are here this morning because someone gave us the gift of inviting us, right? Right? And maybe no person came to you personally and invited you. Maybe you drove by the building and saw the sign outside and were like, oh, a church, cool. But like that sign was a gift. It, it only exists because people gave. And then when you came the first time, there was a parking lot for you to park in and that was, exists because someone gave and a sidewalk to get to the sanctuary. And when you got to the sanctuary, there's bulletins to show you the flow of worship because someone took the time to prepare that for you. And there were musicians and singers and everything. It's a gift. Everything was given. And so your prayers, your presence, your service, your work, your finances, everything that you gave all year made St. Mark's, made church possible for us over the last year. Everything runs on generosity at a church. And when we kind of give and we fall into the rhythm of doing this every week, sometimes we lose sight of just how important our work is, and we lose track of all the little stories of the ways that we have changed lives together. So it's good for us to take time to remember how important our life and ministry as a church is. And so for Generosity Campaign this year, we chose the theme of, like, abundant life. It sounds really nice but it goes back to a core fundamental belief that we have in the Christian faith that we believe that God wants all people to experience an abundant, a, a good and loving life with him. And so when we give, God uses those gifts in special ways to make abundant life possible for people. And we're going to highlight each week a different way that we as a church do that. Last week you talked about community, right? Right? We give people the gift of community at a time when communities are just literally falling apart and disappearing all over. When community feels more and more virtual and maybe not tangible and real. Just by existing and being a place, being a home for people, and then going out and being gracious to others and inviting them to join us, it's a tremendous gift that we give. This week, we're going to highlight the next one. We're going to highlight compassion. How compassion is a gift that we give our community in order that they might experience the abundant life that God has for them. And that's how we ended up choosing today's story. And we've heard the, like, official Bible version of it, but it's such a short story, and there must be a story behind the story. And so we're going to try and dig into that a little bit together today. So I'm going to tell it to you one more time. It might have been a cold day in the town of Capernaum, where Matthew lives. Capernaum is a seaside town, which means in the winter, the wind comes in off of the lake. Maybe you live in Tucson now because you're escaping, something like that. The wind that comes in off the cold water, the rain that comes with it, is biting and chilly. This is the same wind and rain that Jesus in a boat calmed just a couple chapters ago, right? But it's not calm every day. 
And maybe on this day, it's not calm. The cold wind is coming in off the sea and it's blowing through the streets of Capernaum. And as biting as the wind can be that comes in off the ocean during the winter, there's a certain kind of more biting and chilly coldness that is probably found at one corner of the main road of town, where there we learn sits a young man who's named Matthew at his table and booth. The table and a booth and a line of angry people. And we learn that this young man's name is Matthew. At least that's what his father and his mother named him long ago. When he was born, they would wait eight days to have a naming ceremony, and they would invite friends and family to celebrate the gift of this child to their family. And so they would choose a name that embodies how they feel, and they chose the name in Hebrew, it's Matityahu, which translates as just gift of God. Aren't kids like that? He's a gift that they've received. They're so thankful. But now, fast forward years later, the people that are standing around Matthew's booth, they don't call him Matthew. They don't look at him and say, what a gift from God! (laughs) They have new names for him. Sinner. Traitor tax collector, just calling him by his title. I imagine there's a few others that might be a little bit more creative. Because to be a tax collector at their time and their place meant that you were giving aid, you were supporting the empire that came in and overthrew your people, that were occupying your land. You were helping them in their work of oppression. Rome takes whatever Rome wants. And the taxes were heavy and they were oppressive. And so they would ask a local to go and do the dirty work for them. Can you go to your friends and neighbors and in town and take what we want from them? And you can earn a salary by just taking a little bit extra and we'll turn the other way. And so a lot of tax collectors use that opportunity to actually gain a pretty wealthy life. We'll meet a couple of them in other stories with Jesus, right? And so when people see him, people who used to be friends, people who used to be neighbors, teachers, family, they no longer probably greet him with, gift from God, there you are. They have new names for him. And they're cold. And it bites. So Matthew sits at his booth in Capernaum on a cold day, and he collects the taxes like he always does. And I wonder when we get to a story like this, I I stop and I ask questions of the text. Why would someone say yes to taking a job as a tax collector? It turns you against your own people and your own family. Sure, the income might have been good, but consider the cost. That now when you walk through town, there's no peaceful shalom greeting or welcome? I mean, maybe some of the people who took the job are just, just, just greedy. They'll just do anything it takes to get ahead and to get wealth. We know people like that. Sometimes we act that way too. But with Matthew, I think it's different because we'll see in the, in the text, the minute he has a chance to get out, he says he, he takes it, right? So I don't think it's, it's, it's too much to say that. I don't think Matthew wants to be there. I don't think he wants this job. So then I wonder, why would you take a job that you don't want? Why would you sacrifice your honor and your reputation in this way? What must have happened to this young man that would make him so desperate enough that he would take the job as a tax collector, even if it meant selling out his own people? his own faith, his own God. What happened to Matthew that he said yes to a job that hurts the people he loves? We maybe know people like this. We maybe know stories like this too, don't we? The debt piled up and piled up and got too big, and soon enough the landlord is going to knock, and so people get desperate. Or their child gets sick, and even in Capernaum, you can't pay a doctor with fish. 
So you get desperate. Tragedy strikes while you're young, and maybe your parent who was supposed to provide for you got ill or is now no longer here, and you're a young person left to face a big world alone. You get desperate. You say yes to things you normally never would have imagined. I would guess that something happened to Matthew. Something so big that when Rome came and offered, he had to say yes. Yes to a job that might give him more income, but made him less human every day. Yes to a life of names and coldness and anger, where his neighbors once welcomed him as a gift, now they curse his presence. So he sits every day at his table and his booth, and there's now a rhythm to his work. Next! He calls, and the line shuffles and moves, and the next person comes forward to the table and slams their taxes down. Matthew maybe tries to meet their eyes occasionally. People he knows and grew up with looking for understanding or love or forgiveness. But it's cold, so the line moves one by one. Next, he calls, and they slam it down. And then next, the line shuffles and they put it down. This rhythm continues. It's the rhythm of his life that he is stuck in. Next. Next. And I bet it starts to break his heart. I bet there's times when he can't even look up. He maybe looks down. He's overcome with guilt and shame and sadness. He can't bear to even look into their faces any longer. So I think as he's looking down, he calls, next, one more time, and the line shuffles, but there's no slam this time. And with the rhythm broken, he's a little bit surprised. The next person has stepped forward silently, but they haven't put anything down. And then I imagine if this ever happens, if you're the tax collector, you have to brace yourself, because this is probably when a real bad day is only going to get worse. Because if people don't pay their taxes, there's going to be trouble. If people won't pay what they owe Rome, the guards are there to take them away. So looking into the faces of your friends and family, it might be his job to stand and to order the guards to take away this person who has not put their payment down. He only has half a heart left, and the rest of it will just break if this is what today will bring him. But Matthew looks up, and he's surprised. The set of eyes and the face that he meets is one that he doesn't know. This isn't someone he grew up with. This is someone from out of town. They're not from the neighborhood. And Matthew is sharp. He's had to be alert his whole life. So his eyes take in everything quickly. Oh, this person is dressed in traveling clothes. And oh, his sandals are rather worn. But he's wearing the fringes, the ceremonial garments on his robe. He's a devout Israelite from the community. He must be a religious leader. And look, he's got a whole group of people that stand behind him, watching everything he does as if they're taking mental notes to learn his way. Disciples. And it clicks for Matthew. Oh, it's a rabbi. Oh, great. One more perfect person here from the religious group to come here and tell him how horrible of a person he is and how messed up his life is and how much he's hurting everybody and how angry God must be with him, you sinner, you tax collector. And he's got all these disciples with him, right? All these other students who were so perfect in the school that they all went to as children and who must have been the ones who were so good that they got picked to be disciples of a rabbi. All their parents must be so proud and honored. And that's what they got. That's what life brought them, and Matthew has been brought to the booth to collect the taxes. All these people that Matthew tried so hard probably to be like and just couldn't do it. There's now a whole crowd of people there just to rub it in. And so maybe it's a cold day, but I bet even Matthew is starting to sweat right now. 
And so his eyes make it back to the center, and he meets the gaze of the rabbi as he's trying to figure out what to do next. Maybe they stare at each other for a few seconds in silence, but then the rabbi's hands move up, and they slam down on the table. And the rabbi leans in with a stern face and says, Next! Now Matthew, like many of us, are totally confused. This has never happened before. What is he supposed to do now? How does he handle this? The rabbi, though, leans in and the stern face turns into a smile. And the rabbi says, do you want to be next? Matthew's still confused, and worse, now he can feel the entire gaze through the rabbi on him. Everyone in town, the guards there, the other tax collectors at the booth, all those disciples, the entire line of angry people. This has never happened before. He has no idea what to do. The rabbi's hands turn over and up. And he says, well, come. Like, follow me. You can be the next one. And Matthew probably can't believe it at first. This is a rabbi inviting him, him, Matthew, to be a student. I mean, first of all, he's way too old. He's not getting picked from school. He wasn't even when he was in school the best of the best to get picked and catch the attention of a rabbi like this. He's a traitor and a sinner. And he's been said to be an enemy of God. But he leans back and he's been invited to be a disciple. And so he looks once again at the booth in front of him, and suddenly it doesn't look the same. It's felt like a prison for years, and this is his life to live, but suddenly it doesn't look like it's his anymore. He doesn't feel stuck. And maybe, I bet, Matthew has a million questions. Who are you? What kind of rabbi are you? What kind of, wait, where are we going if I'm following you? Where do you come from? But... There's maybe just something about the rabbi's smile and the way he looks at Matthew. Maybe no one has smiled at Matthew in years. And so, as surprised as Matthew and everyone else in the crowd is, Matthew puts his own hands on the table and he pushes himself up. The rabbi takes him by the arm and leads him away from the booth and gives him a place in the line. And they start walking away together. And I bet Matthew takes a moment to look back and see that the booth behind them is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. He got out. And as they walk down the street, I bet they probably turn a corner. And as the, they kind of feel that the magic of the moment is over, one of those other disciples who's mind is always on his stomach. For says, you know, Jesus, it's pretty cold, and we still haven't found, like, a place for dinner tonight. And there we get Matthew speaking for the first time in the story. He probably says something like, wait, I think I know the perfect place. And so that's how they end up at Matthew's house. They end up then surrounded in his house by who does he invite? The other tax collectors and sinners, the, probably the only other people that would come to his invitation. But because Matthew has experienced an act of compassion from Jesus, he wants all of the other people who are hurting to get as close to this rabbi as they can. One brave act of mercy on Jesus' part leads not to just the restoration of Matthew, but now to a whole little miniature community that's been aching for compassion for years. And so all these other outcasts and sinners, everyone who has a lot of creative names for them in the town, all the hurting and desperate folks, they flock to Jesus all the time, don't they? Other people saw only their mistakes and would only see what was bad in them, but Jesus sees that they are still good. And other people treated them like enemies and always said that they were unworthy of their time or their love or their generosity, but Jesus treats them as a gift. And so together they sit at a table with a rabbi and they hold each other's hands and they feast together at the table and they sing and they pray. It's a lot like a little church service, isn't it? 
because they're together like we do every week, enjoying the good gifts that God gives. And that's not even the end of the story. There's the big twist, right? Like, because not everyone is there to enjoy the gifts of God. All the good church people, the Pharisees, they aren't pleased with Jesus' compassion. They're actually upset. And like good church people, they don't go directly to Jesus and complain. They go to the disciples to complain about Jesus. And Jesus hears their complaining, though. And the party stops as he stands up. And to the religious leaders who should have memorized the whole thing, he quotes a Bible verse to the angry pastors. He puts them on notice. You have not studied well. You've missed the entire point of our faith. You might think you're close to God because you can ace all the tests and you're perfect, but you've missed the heart of God along the way. Because if you don't have compassion like God has compassion, you've missed the entire abundant life. I love this story so much because it's an example of what kind of God that Jesus is. Not just with Matthew and with this little community of tax collectors, but with all of us. Other people will cast Matthew and the other tax collectors away away as sinners, saying they are no good, they are not worthy of love, but Jesus has this radical belief in the worthiness and goodness of all people. Because all people belong to God, and therefore all people are beloved by God. And so Jesus is able to see through the surface, see through their circumstances, see through even their sins in ways that the rest of us just aren't. And so there is hope for them, and then there is hope for everybody. All people, if this is true, can be redeemed and restored to God because to Jesus, all people are worth his time and his presence and his kindness and his generosity. And so Jesus is able to be radically generous. He gives his love when others refuse to. And that love, his compassion, actually has the power to change lives. If this story is true, it works. Love changes lives. And compassion creates abundance. And so what's cool about Jesus is also just what's so cool about St. Mark's. I love that during generosity campaign, I just get to boast about us quite a bit. Because we are a community of people that have dedicated ourselves to the mission that we want to love people the way that Jesus loves people, right? And so we put our love, our love isn't just a nice feeling that we have that we come together and sing about and stuff like that. We put that love into action. It's compassion. This last year, your compassion, the gifts you've given, have filled people's bellies with food who didn't have food to eat. You did it. How cool is that? You provided comfort to people who are grieving. Your kind words and presence have healed the hearts of those who are hurting. We have brought peace to people who live in fear. We have given, as we celebrated last week, our community, a church, a home to be with God, with a literal table and chairs, so they know they're part of God's family, that they belong. We invite all others to enjoy this abundant life with us, and that invitation often looks like compassionate service and care. So as we look forward to a new year of ministry together, as we're considering where does our generosity need to go and how is God calling us to be generous, generous, I ask you, I beg you, please, please do it again. One more time. One more year. Give again. Hear the calling of God to be next, to join him in going along in his line to giving with compassion and mercy to each other and outside to the world, to our neighbors. And let's watch together how God will change their lives and restore hearts. So come with us as we go, as we go out to serve and to care, to create abundant life in our little pocket of the world. Come with us as we go to every table and booth that we can and invite others to be the next ones to come and follow God with us because, friends, our town is full of Matthews who don't know to whom they belong and are waiting for an invitation to a better, abundant life. May we make sure that they don't miss their invitation to the feast. Amen.